Okay, so uh, I think it's time. Welcome everyone, uh, I am Mateusz Jurczyk and today I will be talking about effecting fi effective file format fuzzing, uh, specifically some of the techniques, methods and the results that I've had uh, during the few years of fuzzing that I've been doing uh, at Google. So a few words about myself. Uh, I work at Project Zero. Uh, what is relevant to the talk is that I am a part-time developer and a frequent user of the fuzzing infrastructure that we have there internally. Uh, and uh, it is very related to what I will be discussing here today. I also play CDFs and I'm generally interested in all sorts of vulnerability research and software exploitation. So uh, today uh, I will be talking about what constitutes real-life offensive fuzzing. Uh, so fuzzing for actually finding bugs that um, you can probably exploit or in my case report um, to the vendors. And um, I would like to uh, talk about how each of the stages uh, that is part of fuzzing is typically implemented and what you can do better uh, to actually improve your results and uh, find more bugs. And so this is going to be all shown on the example of several different pieces of software that I have fuzzed in the past, uh, including Adobe Reader, Adobe Flash, Windows Kernel and some other uh, open source software. Uh, so let's start with some very, very soft basics. Uh, we probably know what fuzzing is. So uh, it's just a software testing technique, uh, which is most uh, often automated. And it's all about just feeding invalid data to the uh, software that we are testing. So in the case of my talk, uh, the software part is just uh, commonly used programs and libraries, which can be both open and closed source. Uh, the important thing is that they are written in native languages. And uh, this means that they can be used for memory corruption style uh, zero day attacks. And on the other hand, the inputs are just, uh, we assume that they are files of different uh, structure, which may be uh, documented or undocumented, uh, and they are processed by the software. So it, that they can be websites, applets, images, videos, and stuff like that. So uh, in general, the scheme of fuzzing is very simple. We just have a loop inside of which we choose an input, mutate it, fit it to the target, and then see if the target has actually crashed or not. If it has, we save the input, and if it hasn't, uh, then we just proceed. Of course, this is still very simple. Uh, but while the general scheme is, is very, very easy, uh, it's the, the thing that uh, is easy to learn, but it's, it's more hard to master. So if we try to dig deep into um, how to fast effectively, we have several questions that we have to answer. Uh, so we have to think about how we choose the, the fuzzing target in the first place, how we generate the inputs, uh, where do we take them from, if we have some base corpus, how do we, how do we mutate them, and uh, there is like a huge list of things that we actually have to consider. Uh, some of these things are taken care of by the fuzzer that uh, we are using if we, uh, if we use an uh, off-the-shelf one, but if we are trying to create a fuzzing system on our own uh, for whatever reason, then we actually have to think about all of those things. So uh, I, will, I will discuss uh, some of those things and try to answer uh, to the best uh, of my knowledge how to, how to make them as effective as possible. So let's start with uh, gathering the initial corpus of input files. Uh, probably most people doing fuzzing actually go through this step. Uh, because it is a desired step in a majority of cases for several reasons. Of course, it makes it possible to uh, reach some code paths uh, in immediately after starting the fuzzing, so uh, we don't have to uh, recover all of this file structure by ourselves. We already have a good starting point. Uh, we, have, we may have some uh, complex data structure inside of those files, uh, which could be either very difficult or impossible to generate even if we have code coverage information available. Uh, and even if uh, these constructs could be created by, for example, using code coverage based fuzzing, uh, we are still saving a lot of time by doing uh, uh, the initial corpus uh, generation. Um, and uh, of course, if we have a specific corpus of, of uh, files in a, in a format, such as, for example, PDF, we can reuse the same corpus to fuzz different projects uh, afterwards. So the standard methods of doing this uh, is as follows. First of all, uh, many open source projects actually already include extensive sets of input data for testing that we can use. For example, the FFmpeg project, uh, which is a video and media processing library, um, has something called FFmpeg Fate, and uh, it's a system for regression testing in FFmpeg, and it already has like hundreds of interesting files that you can use. Uh, sometimes these files are not publicly for everyone, but if you uh, 
um, reach out to the developers and let them know that you want to test their software. They might be happy to share some of their private, private samples with you. Uh, and also many of the projects, especially the open source one, actually uh, include converters from format X to their own format uh, Y. And the example here would be the WebP image format, which has a converter called CWebP, which can co convert from PNG, JPEG, and TIFF. Another thing that we could do is internet crawling. Um, so it all, of course, depends on the popularity of the fast file format, but uh, it's quite an intuitive approach. So we could either just download files with a specific file extension or with a specific magic bytes or some other way of, of recognizing those files. Uh, the problem is that if we are targeting a very popular file format, we can end up with uh, terabytes of data, but it's not really a problem if we can distill it to a reasonable corpus uh, somehow. Uh, but another interesting idea is that we could actually try to uh, ask the actual target what it thinks, uh, whether it thinks that it supports the specific file or not. Um, so this could be either achieved by using code coverage again, but uh, this tends to slow down the process very much. But in some cases, you can just directly ask the question to the program itself. And the case study here would be IDA Pro. So as you probably know, IDA Pro has a long list of supported formats. This is not the complete list, but uh, it's already a lot of items here, uh, probably several dozens of them. And um, so when you try to load a file in IDA, what happens first is you see this window, which uh, lists all of the formats that it has recognized inside of the file, and you can choose how to load this file. Uh, but the real question is, how does this really work? Uh, and to, to, to find out about it, uh, you have to look into the loader architecture in IDA. And it turns out after a few minutes that uh, they have a modular design with, with each loader being uh, inside of a separate file. So inside of your installation directory, you have a long list of files, uh, which are basically just uh, DLLs or shared objects or some other file depending on the architecture, which exports two functions, accept file and load file. And uh, you have uh, two versions of each of those files for 32-bit and 64-bit version of IDA. Um, so the definitions of those two functions uh, you can see here. They are also documented in the IDA SDK. Uh, they are very simple. They just take some input stream and output some information about the file. So accept file is basically the function which performs some very preliminary uh, processing. And it returns 0 on 1 depending on whether IDA can actually handle this file or not. And uh, load file is the more complicated function, which actually takes, takes care of uh, the regular processing of the file when you decide to load the file. And uh, yeah, as I said, both functions are very well documented. Uh, and uh, this is very convenient for us. So uh, when I was uh, fuzzing IDA myself, I decided that I could just write a simple loader, which would iterate through all of those loaders, call the accept file function, and uh, see which file it would uh, um, recognize. So here you can see an example of uh, running uh, the loader against itself, and uh, you can see that elf.llx actually recognized the file as elf, which is correct. So this was very helpful to actually, uh, from a large corpus of files, see which files would be handled by IDA correctly without doing all the code coverage uh, information extraction or anything more complicated like that. Um, so this was very good because uh, it was... Uh, it, it uh, worked with a very high degree of confidence because the accept file uh, function actually has some extensive logic to determine whether the file should be accepted or not. Uh, thanks to this, we also knew that uh, which loader exactly would be able to load. So we would know which loader we would be able to find bugs in using the specific file. Uh, we didn't really have to even start IDA because we would just call a simple function from, from a single DLL or shared, shared object, and we didn't have to use any instrumentation. So similar techniques could probably be used for software, which makes it possible to quickly determine whether it supports the specific file or not, uh, which can be useful sometimes. So the other thing is, after we already uh, try to uh, get uh, get like the initial large set of files is that we could try to distill it. And um, I believe that in fuzzing it is quite important to get rid of most of the redundancy in the input corpus. And this means both the first one that we actually start fuzzing with and also the living one, which is uh, being used while we, we do the fuzzing and evolve the corpus to get a better one. So in the context of a single test case, uh, 
we want to maximize uh, the program states explore divided by the input size, uh, which means that we want to have the highest ratio of uh, byte to program feature, basically. So the, the highest number of uh, functionality starts by the smallest number of bytes. And likewise, in terms of the whole corpus, we also want to maximize the whole set of program states divided by the number of input samples because we don't want to have too many of them exercising the same functionality. Um, so uh, if, um, if there is too much data to actually process uh, using corpus distillation with code coverage information, uh, we may also try to write uh, some kind of uh, minimizer on our own based on the basic structure of the file. Some, su some file formats have some basic structure which is, uh, for example, being divided into chunks that have tags or some names. Uh, this is the case for Swift files, PDFs, PNGs, and many other files that you can see out there. Um, so such generic parsing can already be used to do some very quick preprocessing before we do anything more complex. Uh, but you have to be careful not to go too deep into the specifications because then it gets uh, harder and uh, the result is not as cost effective as it is while we just do very basic uh, processing. So now the question is, how do we actually define the program state? Because the file sizes and the cardinality, which was part of the expression, are, are both trivial to measure. But a program state is more difficult. Uh, so we don't really have any good uh, metric for measuring program states, uh, especially with the characteristics that we would like to have uh, while doing fuzzing. So we would like the, the, the program state to be defined such that uh, the number of them should be within the same range. So we cannot really count all combinations of bits in memory. Uh, they should be meaningful in the context of memory safety. Uh, and they should be, e we should be able to easily determine them during program runtime. So uh, the most approximations used today are just assuming that code coverage is uh, somewhat uh, equal to program states. And of course, this has many uh, advantages because uh, first of all, increased code coverage is representative of new program states, uh, which is good for us. Uh, the same range requirement is met, of course, because code coverage information is typically linear in size to the overall program size. And uh, we can usually easily measure it uh, using compiled and external instrumentation. But the dis disadvantages uh, is that um, constant code coverage doesn't really indicate that uh, the program state is uh, the program state set is also constant. So we could be missing some information using this method. Uh, so yes, uh, the current uh, state of art is just counting basic blocks, and it's a uh, it's a reasonably good uh, approximation because they have quite good granularity. Uh, we shouldn't really measure instructions typically because uh, uh, this is redundant information. Uh, so we can measure the code coverage of basic blocks using uh, compiler instrumentation such as GCOV or uh, external instrumentation such as Intel PIN and DynamoRIA and just identify those basic blocks by the address of the first instruction. But uh, the problem with this approach is that we could be still missing some information so here we have a very simple program with a full function, uh, which has a very, if, a very simple if statement. So uh, we have three calls of this function. And when we uh, perform the first call, we actually go through all of the basic blocks uh, through some of the edges. Uh, so we could uh, think that we have the maximum coverage of this function as of now. But if we see this uh, second call, we can see that a new path is actually being taken, a new branch here. And uh, the same goes for the second call as well. So uh, if we're just measuring the, the basic blocks, we could be missing this information. Uh, so another idea to uh, approaching uh, measuring code coverage would be to not measure basic blocks. So not uh, the vertices of the graph of the uh, code execution, but the edges. And this is, of course, what AFL is trying to do. So they were the first to introduce this and ship at large. And you can, uh, you can read in the technical white paper of AFL that uh, they are noting the combination of the current location that is reached in the code and the previous location uh, inside of the bitmap of, of all basic blocks. Uh, so yes. Uh, but we could also extend this idea even further. So 
in a more abstract sense, recording edges is recording the current block and the one previous, but we could also record even more information by, by tracking not the only previous block, but also uh, more of them. So, for example, n previous blocks and the current one, which would provide even more context as of how the program actually arrived at the current state. Um, but in my experience, uh, the direct edges are quite a good approximation uh, because uh, they are fast to determine and um, they also uh, they, they don't have too much uh, redundancy. Uh, but yes, so you can also have even more granular information such as counters and bit sets. Uh, so instead of just recording whether a specific basic block or edge has been reached or not, we can count how many times it has been reached or not. Uh, and um, this can uh, be useful, for example, when we try to determine how many times a specific loop has been uh, has iterated over, uh, which could be helpful, for example, in a case where we want to uh, uh, go through um, a string comparison or some other logic uh, of that kind. So uh, we have all these different kinds of coverage information that we would like to uh, extract. Of course, we can do it uh, using Intel PIN or Dynamo E or some other DBI. Uh, for example, AFL uses a modified version of QM user. Uh, for open source, we can use the built-in compiler um, compiler instrumentation, such as GCOV and LLVMCOV. Uh, but uh, what I have been using personally and uh, would recommend to, to use is sanitizer coverage. So sanitizer coverage is just an option of address sanitizer, which you are all probably familiar with, which is a fast, reliable uh, instrumentation for detecting memory safety issues. So uh, it's very useful for fuzzing it by itself. Uh, there are also now, many other variants such as memory sanitizer, threat sanitizer, etc. And uh, one thing you can also enable while uh, um, enabling other sanitizer is the sanitizer coverage, which uh, at the same time as validating the um, runtime of the li library or program also provides information about the code coverage. Um, so I, I am using it personally. Also, the LibFuzzer project, which is uh, the, the project of Costia, which, who is the creator of of other sanitizer uh, uses sanitizer coverage. Here we have an example of sanitizer coverage usage. So we have a very short program uh, which has some full function, which is only called if the number of parameters is two. So uh, you can uh, just use two simple compile time options to enable it. And then you can see that after we call the program with, zero, well, with one and two parameters, the size of the output um, uh, output files with the coverage information is different. It has either four or eight bytes. So now that we can uh, measure code coverage easily, uh, the question is, what do we do now? Uh, first of all, we have to remember that just measuring code coverage by itself is not really a silver, silver bullet. Uh, and um, there are still many code constructs which are impossible to cross with just dump mutation-based fuzzing. Uh, examples of this would be uh, comparisons of types that are larger than a single byte, uh, for example, or um, comparisons of memory blobs or, or ASCII strings. Uh, so you can see those examples here. Uh, a comparison with a 32-bit value, of course, is a, is a very difficult to cross with just a dump fuzzer because we would have to guess this, this specific 32-bit value. Uh, and the same thing goes with the string comparison, which would be even harder to guess. Mm, so that problems are actually somewhat approachable, if you think about it. Uh, mm, because you can, uh, for example, use approaches such as dictionaries, which are um, supported in both AFL and libfuzzer. Uh, which uh, could be used to, to find those spe specific values that are being searched for in the code. And uh, you can also get some help from compiler flags, but uh, this, is, uh, this is somewhat complicated to think about because the somewhat unintuitive approach would be to disable all code optimization, uh, which would result in fewer hacky expressions in assembly, compressed code constructs, folded basic blocks, and stuff like that. So we'd get uh, more granular code coverage information to analyze. But on the contrary, Alcamtov also found that if you use the O3 optimization with unroll loops, uh, then some of the short uh, string comparisons or string uh, um, signatures are being unrolled to, to just very simple uh, byte granular comparisons. So it's quite unclear which compilations frags uh, should really be used uh, for coverage-guided fuzzing, 
And it's probably something that you should adjust based on uh, the specific project that you are trying to fuss. Mm, so in the past, also Tavis Ormandy tried to approach this problem somehow uh, with another DBI of his that he called Deep Cover Analysis. So he tried to extract some more granular information uh, about the specific instructions that are used for string comparisons, for example. Uh, so he, he implemented this to measure uh, how far the execution of the REPS CMPB uh, instruction went uh, before bailing out, or how many bits uh, were successfully compared by the CMP instruction. And he was able to, to uh, use this approach to be able to actually uh, recover CRC32 checksums required by uh, the PNG decoders. <sighs> And uh, when I was first creating these slides a few months ago, uh, I also thought that the ideal feature would be to have a, comp a specific compiler designed for fuzzing, which would be able to create very de-optimized code uh, with all of the assembly being maximally simplified, uh, with all of those 32-bit uh, and 16-bit uh, comparisons being unrolled to byte comparisons and stuff like that. So, um, for example, the construct on the left would be uh, changed to the construct on the right. Uh, and it turned out that this has actually been achieved in the meanwhile. So in August, uh, a research has been presented uh, resulting in a, in a LLVM compiler um, plugin that was actually able to, to perform these de-optimizations. And uh, this helped AFL to, to discover several new bugs. And uh, the other part of the ideal feature would be that uh, the standard comparisons functions uh, uh, which are very annoying. We could have a compiler-based solution for just having a, a separate version, a separate uh, piece of code in the assembly for each of the calls of those functions in the code, uh, which would help us get some more uh, granular information as well. But we still have some unsolvable problems, such as when uh, the value that are being loaded from the input is actually processed somehow before being compared uh, with some signatures. And this we cannot really approach with any of the dump um, ideas that I've presented before. But this is about dump fuzzing, so we have to, uh, we have to just um, agree with that. So now that we have lots of input files, we have the compiled target and the ability to, to measure code coverage. The question is, uh, how do we proceed uh, from here? And um, this is assuming that uh, we would like to create some corpus management system. I would like to present some algorithm of how I do it myself. Uh, so let's assume that we would like to have the system for code, co code gu coverage guided corpus management, uh, which would have the following properties. First of all, it would be able to minimize an initial corpus of potentially gigantic sizes to a smaller one that is equally useful. So on input, we would have n input files, and on output, we would have m uh, input files and information about their code coverage. And of course, this should be scalable. Uh, this is the first property, and the second one is that we would also like, it, would like to use it during fuzzing. First of all, to decide if a specific mutated sample should be added to the corpus at runtime, and to recalculate all of this uh, coverage information e uh, if needed. So the input here would be just uh, the current corpus and its coverage and the candidate sample and its coverage. And on output, we just should have the new corpus and its coverage. Uh, so yes, the prior work for this is uh, that the set cover problem, so this is the set cover problem or, or just a, a specific version of it, uh, which in itself is uh, just NP-hard. So we cannot really calculate the optimal solution in reason reasonable time but we don't really have to do it. And in fact, it's probably better if we just uh, don't find the optimal solution, but a somewhat, opt somewhat optimal one. Um, and there are actually greedy algorithms which can find approximates in uh, some uh, reasonable time. Uh, an example of such an algorithm would be that uh, we store the current corpus and the current coverage. And for every new sample, we just check if it adds some new trace to the cover current code coverage. So if it does, then we add it to the corpus, otherwise we discard it. Um, and periodically, we could also optionally check if the sum of the samples are redundant inside of the corpus and remove them to, to, to keep the uh, general uh, size small. But this has some, uh, some 
significant drawbacks. So for example, it doesn't scare, scale very well because we have to process all of the samples sequentially. Uh, and also, uh, the size and form of the corpus depends on the order in which the samples are processed. So if we tr uh, start processing the big files at the beginning and then uh, the smaller ones later, then we would uh, end up with a very large corpus which is not necessary. So we have very little control over the, over the um, trade-off between volume and redundancy in the output corpus. So what I would like to propose is another design, uh, which is as follows. For each execution trace we know, uh, we store the n smallest samples which reach that trace, and the overall corpus consists of all the files present in the structure. Uh, and the structure can be represented as a C++ uh, uh, STL object uh, map, which maps a string, which is the name of the sample, uh, sorry, the name of the trace into a set of pairs consisting of the names of the samples and its sizes. So here is an example on an illustration. We have uh, four, sam four input samples which have some coverage and then we transform it into a list of traces which map to a maximum of two files per that trace. Uh, and uh, they are of course the smallest one here. So the advantages of this approach would be that uh, this, of course, can be very trivially parallelized uh, with any number of machines using the MapReduce model. Uh, the extent of redundancy can be controlled via the end parameter. Uh, we, during fuzzing, the corpus uh, will evolve to minimize the average sample size by design because we are storing the n smallest samples. Uh, we have at least n samples for each trace, uh, which results in a very uniform code coverage distribution across the entire set, as compared to just uh, having uh, like one samples per each trace. And uh, the upper limit for the number of input is uh, limited, but in practice it's much less than actually the number of coverage traces times n. Uh, this approach also has some shortcomings. Uh, so due to the fact that each trace has the smallest samples in the corpus, uh, for some basic traces uh, we will end up with some redundant short files which, which don't really exercise any interesting functionality. For example, for PNG, uh, we, have, we have some files which just have the basic headers uh, and stuff like that, or just basic headers and then a single chunk. Um, so very short files which aren't really useful for fuzzing. But I still think this, this is an acceptable trade-off, uh, especially given that having a such short inputs may also enable us to find some uh, unexpected behavior, for example, also handling uh, some other types of magics uh, by the target that we didn't initially expect. So here is the algorithm in a kind of pseudocode. So the map phase is really simple. We just get the code coverage provided by the input data. And for each trace ID, we output the trace ID and the pair of sample ID and uh, the size of the file. So here you can see it. We transform the list of the uh, input files into a, a map of traces mapping to, to the samples. Uh, it first looks like this. And then the reduce, for the reduce phase, uh, we just sort uh, for each of the traces, we just sort the list by the size of the samples and then choose the n smallest one and output them. Uh, so here we uh, start with this input. Uh, we just sort the files by size and then we choose the n smallest ones, which in this case is two. And this is our output. So at the end, we end up with uh, this uh, list of files at the, uh, at the at top, and then we just sort it and uh, get a new unique list, and we end up with a total of three out of four files in the initial corpus. So when it comes to the actual track record uh, for using this algorithm in uh, my infrastructure, I've successfully used it to distill uh, by data sets of terabytes to, to distill it into somewhat reasonable corpuses. And the examples are, are PDF format uh, based on instrumented PDF -um. So I generated three corpuses based on n equals 1, 10, and 100 uh, to, to get some nice corpuses for fuzzing with different degree of uh, redundancy. And I've done the same for, for free type 2. Uh, so when it comes to the, to the algorithm of uh, um, determining whether a new candidate is good for fuzzing or not, the algorithm is uh, a little bit more complex. First of all, we go through each of the trays which is covered by the sample and see if it improves 
uh, the side, the size of, of one of the traces. So if it's smallest, smaller than uh, the size of the lar largest file in the set, and if uh, any such improvement is, uh, is, uh, is achieved, then we perform a second pass to remove all files from the set we have, which have the same size as, as this uh, file. And uh, his, here is an illustration of this approach. So we have this candidate called uh, 5.pdf, which has size 20. Uh, so first thing we do is that we try to improve some of the uh, covered traces here. And it turns out that two of them are improved. So we insert the 5.pdf file for two of the covered traces, and then we perform the second pass and also replace two other files, which also had size 20 to reduce the total number of files in the set. Um, so th this was about uh, distilling the whole corpus and merging in a single file. And if we want to merge two corpora, um, then uh, it's also trivial by just choosing the smallest n samples for each of the traces that are covered by it. And uh, one of the things that I passed uh, and had some success with using this approach was Wireshark, uh, which I've been fuzzing since November last year, uh, using the T-Share command line utility with, uh, built with ASAN and ASAN coverage. Uh, I discovered 35 vulnerabilities using this approach. And the interesting thing is that initially I started with some simple sample files from the page sample captures for Wireshark. Uh, and it was 300 files, which had over 200 megabytes. Uh, uh, so mostly those files were very big. But upon several months of coverage-guided fuzzing, I actually was able to first create a very good corpus, which consisted of uh, almost 80,000 files. But the median file size was just 47 bytes. So they were really actually optimal for fuzzing. Um, and if you want to test out your fuzzing infrastructure, Wireshark is actually a very good thing uh, to do this on because uh, the nature of the code base makes it extremely well uh, fit for dump fuzzing because it has a vast number of disk sectors for different formats. It's mostly written in C and operates on very, very simple data structurally. So it just mostly compares single bytes or, or some very, very simple uh, constructs in the input file. Um, so it's a, generally a very great test target for your fuzzer. And uh, this is the trophy case for Wireshark in the Project Zero tracker. Uh, also, this approach uh, proved to be useful for uh, Adobe Flash. So I've been fuzzing it for many years, um, not, not so much with coverage, uh, coverage guidance, but uh, recently I started targeting the action script loader class. And in the official documentation, you can see that the loader class is supposed to only support JPEG, PNG, GIF, and S SWF files. Uh, but when I was fuzzing this with uh, coverage information, after several hours of fuzzing, I observed two sudden peaks in the number of coverage, coverage traces. Uh, and when I looked into the input corpus, I noticed that uh, the fuzzer discovered two new signatures uh, called ATF and II. Uh, which corresponds to uh, a format that I didn't know before, which is called Adobe Texture Format for Stage 3D, uh, which can have embedded JXR files. Uh, so these are two very complex file formats uh, whose support was not documented anywhere, and I was able to discover this by just using this code coverage uh, <laughs> algorithm. And I found seven vulnerabilities in those formats thanks to this discovery so far. Um, so also, uh, when it comes to corpus post-processing, uh, if the files are stored in a way which makes them difficult to mutate, uh, you can do some preprocessing, such as uh, decompressing them. If they are compressed, uh, for example, uh, in SWF files, uh, you typically, typically have them in a LZMA compressed form, such as with the CVS signature. Uh, PDF documents also have most of the binary streams compressed with deflate, so you can also decompress them to make sure that the bit flipping makes sense. Uh, and also type 1 fonts are always encrypted with a simple cipher. Uh, so as several things about running the target and several trips, uh, so we have to distinguish between command line and graphical applications. Uh, it's generally prefer, uh, for, at least for me, for the target program to be command line uh, only, which is quite common on Linux and less so on Windows. Uh, most open source libraries actually ship with some ready testing tools, uh, which are command line, which we can use for fuzzing. Uh, 
Uh, and this is much cleaner in terms of interaction, logging, and basically everything else in fuzzy. Um, but there are also some graphical Linux, uh, graphical applications for Linux, uh, in which case we can use the X virtual frame buffer to, to deal with this. And um, the thing is that for some applications, the amount of input data processed is actually dependent on the amount of data which is displayed on the screen, uh, which is the case, for example, for Adobe Reader. And my solution for that was to just start a virtual uh, X frame buffer uh, with a very huge resolu resolution and then start Adobe Reader such that it would have a huge window displaying all of the pages at the same time. Uh, so this is the result. Uh, it was a very dumb way to make sure that as much PDF data was processed as possible, and it really uh, improved the number of bugs that I was able to find uh, in Adobe Reader. Uh, and it's interesting because Adobe Reader is supposed to be a, a, be a graphical-only application, but if you start it from command line with the help uh, command line argument, you can see that it actually has a lot of command line uh, arguments. And uh, while we're at Adobe Reader, uh, I wanted to mention that I performed some fuzzing of it in 2012 uh, and 13, which uh, with some bugs fuzz, uh, found. But then in 2014, uh, after Adobe Reader for Linux was discontinued, I still had some very like better methods than before. So I still wanted to find some bugs in Adobe Reader. Um, but I couldn't really use a new version because it was discontinued. So my idea was to use the Linux version and fuzz it on Linux and then see if any bugs would actually reproduce on the Windows version. And it turned out that I ended up with uh, over 700 crashes in total in the Linux version, out of which 11 reproduced on the Windows version as well. And they were fixed in, uh, in 2014 and 15. Um, so when the program misbehaves, there are certain behaviors that uh, are undesired uh, during fuzzing. For example, we don't want to deal with some generic exception handlers, which would mask uh, the exceptions that we want to catch and stuff like that. Uh, they could attempt to establish some network connections, user interaction and stuff like that. And I have found that on Linux, it's very convenient to use the LD preload to actually block off some of the functions that you don't want to, be, to have called. Uh, so, for example, you can disable custom exception handling uh, by masking out two functions, such as signal and sig action, uh, just to replace them with no operations. Uh, you can disable network connection by just masking out the socket um, function and stuff like that. And uh, you can also think about fuzzing the command line for some of the targets. Uh, so some projects have multiple command line flags, which might, you might want to flip randomly in order to reach some interesting functionality. Uh, especially in open source projects. Uh, and the solution to that would be to have an external tar target launcher, which uh, determines the actual command line to be used based on some, some data from the actual input files, and uh, use that information to, to pick the, the command line to be used. So for example, we have FFmpeg, where you can specify the output format in which you want the output file to be generated in. And if you list these formats, it turns out that there is over 300 of them. So it makes sense to, to, to try to test all of them. And the logic for the uh, wrapper would be to uh, just choose the encoder based on a hash, which is generated out of the uh, 4,000 bytes, the first bytes in the input file, and then execute such, such a command line. And uh, another funny thing is that you should always make sure that you're not actually losing cycles, which was what I did. So, uh, this is an example of FreeType, which is a very convenient common line utility called FTBench, uh, and it runs through 12 tests, uh, exercising various API library calls. Uh, and when you run it with no special parameters, it takes 25 seconds, for example, to just process the file. Uh, and the important thing is, uh, is the reason for this. You can see that it says number of seconds for each test equals two, which I didn't realize at first. I, it didn't really strike me for a long time, and uh, it turned out that you can use a special flag to actually just use uh, run every test s uh, just once uh, instead of for two seconds. And uh, this, this uh, sp sped up the fuzzing by uh, at least 100 times for me. But I was still able to find some bugs using this very slow fuzzing. Um, so I'm afraid I have to skip uh, through uh, some of the slides here. I wanted to also talk about mutating inputs. Uh, you will be able to check out the slides later on. Uh, there were some interesting th uh, thoughts about 
first of all, how to mutate the data and also what ratios to use for those data because you don't always want to flip a specific number of bytes, but you want to adjust it based on the uh, nature of the input data. Uh, and then I also wanted to quickly talk about uh, the Windows kernel font fuzzing effort. Uh, maybe I'll try to, to talk about it really quickly. So I decided to do it in Box because I'm a very huge fan of it. It's a software emulator and I've already used it for some projects. It's not very fast, but we can still scale against that if we use some more machines than just one. Uh, so it has some very useful properties. It can be run on any Linux system. It provides a documented instrumentation API. Uh, so it makes it possible for you to interact with the guest. Uh, it uh, runs Windows out of the box, uh, which is very simple, and you can easily configure it. So uh, let's do it. When it comes to input to the input data, uh, this part was the easiest one because I already had an input corpus of files based on free type 2 fuzzing. So what I only had to do is to extract true type and open type files uh, because the other ones that free type supports aren't supported by the Windows kernel. Uh, yeah. So then. Part of mutating TTF in the OTF uh, was the, the more interesting. I decided that the mutations would be applied in box instrumentation inside, instead of the guest system itself, because it would be much faster that way. Uh, uh, the question is how to mutate them properly to get the best result, because both TTF and OTF follow a common chunk structure called SFNT, uh, in which each file consists a number of tables, which are public documented. Um, so there are a total of uh, about 50 tables in existence in total, uh, but only 20 or so are actually important. And one thing they have in common is that they all are different. So they have a different length, different structure, different kind of importance for the operating system and the parser and stuff like that. So it only seems reasonable to treat each of them individually instead of fuzz the file as a whole. Uh, so the typical scheme I've seen in nearly every font, font fuzzing uh, presentation would be that we just took the whole font and we would uh, flip some bits in the uh, whole file and then we would just fix up the, the table checksums in the header so that Windows would actually accept it. Uh, but I decided to go a different way and instead of uh, fuzzing or mutating a whole uh, font file, I would be fuzzing each of those tables individually uh, such that uh, I would get... Um, the success to failure ratio at around 50%. Uh, so 50% of the time Windows would actually be able to process the mutated file correctly and 50% of time uh, it would fail, which would mean that uh, we would be kind of at the verge of the mutated file being correct. Uh, so I just wrote a very simple program to actually determine what mutation ratio would be uh, best fit for each of the tables and each of the mutation algorithm to maintain the 93% correctness. And uh, this resulted in the following table of mutation ratios for each of the algorithms and each of the SFNT tables. Uh, so I also didn't set the mutation ratios to be fixed as shown in the previous table, but I also allowed some, uh, some uh, um, freedom in that, so I set a range between zero and two times the, the mutation ratio that I determined. And uh, with a trivial piece of code to disassemble, modify, and reassemble SFNT files, I was now able to mutate them in a very meaningful way, being able to control how they behave in Windows. Uh, I also wrote a very simple TTF generator with TTF instructions, uh, which consisted of the disassembling the TTF files, uh, inserting new instructions with a Python generator, and then reassembling it back. Uh, and I managed to found, find one extra bug with this generator, so quite, quite, a, quite less than with the, just the dump fuzzer itself. Um, and uh, when it comes to the communication channel between the ghost, host and the guest, uh, I used uh, the box instrumentation to detect a specific instruction. Uh, in this case, it was Elfens. Uh, and I use this instruction to uh, implement operations such as request data, which was allowed uh, the harness in the guest to request mutated font data from the host, uh, send status to send status whether uh, the loading of the font succeeded or not, and a simple debug print. Um, so, of course, I had to be very careful to, to, be, to be sure that all of the memory regions passed back to box were uh, mapped in physical memory, so I would be then able to write to it directly. 
Uh, I also implemented a good uh, harness to be able to get the best code coverage in the Windows kernel. So I would call all of the available API functions which were operating on the fonts, and I would list and display all of the glyphs in the font to be to, to make sure that all of the mutations uh, would actually be triggered in the Windows kernel. I also operate, uh, optimized the operating system to the maximum extent, so I disabled all of the uh, themes, disabled services that were not necessary, removed most of the system files, uh, removed all items from AutoStart, disabled paging and stuff like that to make sure that the, the, the Gust system was actually very quick and uh, we wouldn't be losing any cycles inside of the box. Uh, and I, of course, I also had to make sure that the system would actually restart uh, when the crash happened, so I could just detect a system reset as an indicator for a crash uh, in the Windows kernel. And then, when I wanted to reproduce the crashes, I would do it in a separate VirtualBox VM. Uh, I would just load the uh, font in the same way as during the fuzzing, and uh, then check if there is a crash dump in the Windows directory. If so, I would generate um, a report from that and save it. Uh, I also did some minimization, but uh, I won't really talk, talk about it anymore. Uh, but the general result from this research is that I found um, all classes of bugs, basically, mostly pool-based buffer overflows, but also some overreads, use after freeze, and uh, other interesting things. Uh, this was done th uh, in four iterations, and this is not necessarily the end. Uh, there could be more, more bugs discovered, uh, let's see, in the future. Um, so the closing thoughts is that um, hopefully after this effort, no more bugs are lurking in the Windows kernel uh, font processing. Um, let's see if that is the case or not. Uh, either, either way, Microsoft has moved font processing into a user space uh, process, which is good for security, but it could also make fuzzing easier for us. Uh, and yeah, we can still think about using it as an RCA vector, because even though it's not anymore in the kernel, but in user space, uh, we can still use it to get some kind of remote code execution. So with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions probably after the, the talk.